you've been on a path, uh, like a massive transformation, you know, in your own personal life. Then obviously also even, I imagine even your readers, uh, there's been change in that world. Like who is coming to, <laughs> sorry, none of them left. <laughs> who's, who's coming to the workshops, all of that. And so I'm, I'm curious to see the change of your perspective and how it has changed your vision of storytelling. Do you feel like the way that you see stories or that you engage with stories has changed in the past few years? Yeah. And I think I can sum it up pretty quickly, actually. I would say, and I'm moving between a sort of a mythic and a religious perspective, and there's almost no difference in the in the world that I live in. Mm. Myth showed me everything I needed to know about the conditions of living. Different gods and goddesses show you the betrayals, the healings, the strange nuances to it all. It shows you the playing field. It's phenomenal. How to live it was the missing element for me. Mm. And that, I have to say, is the Christian narrative. It's the Christian story because it's so, it actually turns a lot of the myths before it kind of on its head mm. because of this last you'll be first anti kleos kind of thing going on this huge enormous consciousness where we're not just venerating trees and bends in the river and all the thousands and millions of little elohims and messengers that are moving around us we're making a claim that we're in contact with the being that is infused in that but also completely outside of it as well mm. I that was just kind of too big for me. Uh, but in the absence of that, my life, I suppose, up until, you know, up until a few years ago, had the familiar kind of chaotic fault lines of not having that essential kind of binding agent uh, that is Yeshua. Hmm. So a lot a lot has changed. It's not as if my life hasn't been nourished and informed and blessed beyond measure by these stories but the reality is and this is hard this a lot of christians don't like me saying what i'm about to say the reality is you know i i'm with augustine all truth is god's truth yeah. and i think that a lot of these stories there could be some story way up from the inuit and and they and i respect this they may not want to see it in this way but from my point of view Many myths and stories are filled with pinpricks and hints of this great story. Mm. And so I feel that I was on a kind of drip feed for a really long time. And the thing that my heart was swooning for over and over in these stories was something that I could never depend in, defend in public, but was actually this sort of terrifying revelation that actually it was the it was the you know the Aslan of my youth wishing mm. to announce itself. And I ended up, I went on a vigil for 101 days. I went out into a Dartmoor forest. And at the end of it, uh, I had a profoundly uh eviscerating, beautiful, uh unimaginable almost encounter with Christ. But in the one place I never expected to meet him. I went out there thinking, well, by the time I finish this, I'll probably be married to the wild in some way. And I came back married to Christ, and I realized that both of these, these weddings are facing each other. Mm -hmm. It's a strange thing to say. As someone, I'm not a classicist. We're talking about the Odyssey. I'm not a classicist. Um, in England, if you're a classicist, that's kind of connected to a class system. Mm really connected to a certain level of school that you would have gone yeah. to. I didn't go to schools like that. But I have a real experience, understanding, and many decades long involvement with uh, indigenous and shamanic stories. Oddly, they're much, much closer to Christ figures mm. than ones that you get in the West. They understand very well the idea of the suffering healer. They understand very well the one that you're not looking at is the one that is actually kind of binding and through an act of love and sacrifice, bringing new life to the tribe. So I was I was aware of these things. But now, of course, I see the, for example, 
I see, you know, the crucifixion as the supreme poetic event of of human experience. But I, I, it was as if I was just not allowed to see it mm. until I was almost fifty. It was like this, and then God said, "And now, now." And and for the last two years, my Jobian wonder eye has been opened. But for some reason, he wanted me to get all this other yes. stuff in me too. And so I'm in this thrilling and unexpected, you know what midlife is like. You can feel like you've seen all the movies worth possibly seeing. So to be in this new world where I'm meeting uh I like what Paul van der Klee is doing. You know, he's a very interesting man with all his sort of cross associations. You see, I come from, my dad is a preacher. My brother is a pastor. I'm very familiar with all of this. But at the same time, because of orthodoxy, I've been opened up to, I grew up in church. All the action was in the pulpit. Yeah. Now the action's in the liturgy. You know, the pulpit is the only moment. It's the the sermon is the only moment where you can sit down. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, okay, sit down. This is just me for five minutes, and <laughs> everybody, up, you know, stand or I, wisdom, and we're off. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. so I I kind of know where I am, but I also don't know where I am, which is a wonderful place to be. And I think that what you said, you know, the idea that in some ways you had to pack all this other all this other stuff in you i think in some ways you know this might will seem a little maybe i'm pushing it and whatever whatever people think but that it seems like to me that's the role that i perceive that you can have right now in this moment which is you know you use the word the word rewilding christianity uh, there are different ways to say it but there is something in the other myth which in these shamanic stories in the these ancient myths which can can help us see the story of the Bible afresh again, because yeah. in some ways it's giving you tax and it's giving you ways into it that a lot of people have glossed over through their kind of systematic theology, you know, like this is this leads to this, this leads to this, and Jesus died for your sins. And if you believe in him, you go to heaven, you know, that kind of stuff where it's like you've actually stopped looking at the at the crazy things that yeah. Jesus does and the crazy things that, that are in those stories. You you will be aware, and I think we have to kind of uh, certainly in this country, in England we have to doff our caps to Tom Holland, the writer, in his book Dominion. Tom was the first guy that was saying, actually, despite the propaganda, England and the West in general is profoundly Christianized. Now I go along with that for a while, but the problem is we are Christianized civically and culturally. We're not spiritually anymore. We're not. This is not a Christian culture. And so the cross isn't quite, we got that bit, but we haven't got that bit. Uh, so I love the fact that he, yourself, Paul Kingsnorth, lots of others are talking about the fact that we have, we can't be taking our cues from a culture that doesn't give a shit about us anymore mm -hmm. because we just get more and more thinned out, diluted, apologetic. We're sort of, you know, I, don't look at me, don't look <laughs> at me, you know, uh, whereas actually people, I meet people all over the world looking for a deeper life. And the more we take our cues nervously from a culture that at best has amnesia, if not active hostility to these stories, the better. But we need to retell them. Not, not uh anesthetize them or put in little cues to make them politically correct forget that we just need them in their pure genius raw form to be to do their work to let god do his work you know mm. uh i think something's happening i have to say it i think something's happening i've never born in the early 70s i've never seen a moment quite as pregnant as this one i've never known so many people talking about things like this mm. i think you're right you know i think that the way that i see it is something like a like an arc you know it's like we're we're actually there's a contraction of christianity but in that contraction the people that care about it have to do it so deliberately that it cannot be accidental anymore. It can't just be something we're surfing. It just can't be. So we have to look into it deeply. We have to, we we don't have a choice. And so because of it, it creates this weird 
little this 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 smaller but brighter group of people that are can see each other and are uh, you know and I'm amazed like you said like you know if you would ask me to predict Paul Kings North and Martin Shaw you know five six years ago I could not have predicted it but then when mm -hmm. I see when I see that coming over the horizon I'm like yes that that that's that's it like and I can see that like you said I can see things coming together uh, and so it's exciting. I mean, what what other life would you want to lead? It's exciting to be to be in a world that is semi hostile to you, but then being surrounded by a round table of amazing nights is like, what else would I want? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're all in agreement that church needs to be Camelot again. You know, <laughs> I think really. And if people don't think we're in a moment of tremendous peril, they are simply not paying attention. They're not paying attention. All the ingredients you want for a phenomenal myth are occurring in real time right now. <laughs> you don't need to be nostalgic. You didn't miss out. There was no other golden age of myth that was more, more engaging than this. This is the moment. And so find your place at the table. And I say that to everybody. There'll be some kid right now watching us on a phone doing some shift, you know, his third shift at McDonald's. We're talking to you, you know, we're talking to you. Lo locate, locate that noblesse oblige in you and see what kind of trouble you can get into, you know.